Okay, hi everyone. Um, so today let's uh, continue talking about how T cells activate. Uh, and importantly, we will uh, think about um, how it is that when a T cell activates, it knows what to do next. Uh, and this is particularly important when we talk about the difference between how cytotoxic CD8 T cells function and how the um, helper CD4 positive T cells work. So let's uh, back up and remind ourselves that T cells and natural killer cells uh, are closely related. So remember, when we talk about the cartoon um, that depicts how um, hematopoietic stem cells in our bone marrow give rise uh, to, to lymphocytes among the different types of other blood cells that are produced in our, in our bone marrow, we said that uh, we would have a common lymphoid precursor cell that would give rise to things like B cells uh, and to this sort of light purple natural killer, you know, slash T cell precursor cell. And we said that that natural killer T cell precursor cell would leave the bone marrow. Uh, and after it leaves the bone marrow, that's when it sort of decides what it ultimately becomes. It'll either go the pathway of just becoming sort of this dark blue natural killer cell or if this precursor cell makes its way to the thymus, as we've been learning the last couple lectures, that's where um, this precursor cell would be encouraged to become a thymocyte and start doing uh, VDJ recombination to try to make its T cell receptor. Right. So ultimately, um, if you think about the fact that this precursor cell, as it leaves the bone marrow, can become either an NK cell or a T cell receptor, it's not that surprising that in many ways, T cells and natural killer cells have a lot of similarities. Uh, so let's look at some of the similarities between T cells and NK cells, and then contrast that with some of the differences. So similarities are both of these types of cells, T cells or NK cells, uh, produce and store signaling molecules in granules in their cytoplasm. Now, depending upon um, how you know the function of this particular cell, those particular signaling molecules uh, may be very different. So they both depend on receptors on their surface to check out target cells that they synapse with. Right, remember, these lymphocytes, whether you're talking about T cells or NK cells, or even B cells for that matter, right? Um, they have certain types of receptors on their surface uh, to aid in their immune function, but T cells and natural killer cells, right, they're really specific about wanting to only interact with cells that they press up against to give their receptors a chance to kind of check out or evaluate what is this cell that I've bumped up against? What should I do to this cell? Whereas B cells, on the other hand, right, their main goal in life, so to speak, is to make immunoglobulins that can just be sort of released as antibodies eventually if their immunoglobulins turn out to be particularly useful. So B cells don't do their job by, let's say, releasing immunoglobulins directly onto a cell that they synapse with, right? B cells turn into plasma cells and just make antibodies that can flow away, float away somewhere in your in your blood to go to the different tissues of the bodies. Um, and that's where those immunoglobulins would do their job. But T cells and natural killer cells, they have to work by synapsing with another cell and then be able to tell whether that other cell is problematic or if everything is okay. In either case, if you're talking about a T cell or a natural killer cell synapsing with another cell, when that lymphocyte releases the contents of those granules, they are released onto that target cell in order to affect some sort of uh, action, right? So the differences between T cells and NK cells then are that the NK cells kind of non-specifically use a range of different receptors on their surface in order to be able to read or interpret or to check out what the cell is that it's pressed up against. And so as we will learn later, natural killer cells have a library of different types of re uh, receptors that they can express on their surface, right? In order to help kind of inform the NK cell 
you know, what to do when it goes ahead and presses up against another cell. T cells have a range of receptors also. In fact, they have many of the same NK cell receptors, but T cells, right, sort of take it a step further. We said in addition to the other immune receptors that it has, a particular T cell will have a unique T cell receptor also sort of uh, scattered among the other receptors. Uh, and that T cell enables, uh, or that T cell receptor enables the T cell to really specifically identify something that is new and different, right? Something that does not come pre-programmed to be recognized by the sort of more generic immune receptors uh, that an NK cell has. And a further difference is that whereas NK cells primarily function as sort of killers, right? So that would be sort of like the CD8 positive T cells that also function as cytotoxic killing cells. The other type of T cell that we've talked about uh, in terms of being alpha beta T cells are the CD4 helper T cells, right? So there are some differences there. In many ways, I think it's useful for you to think of T cells as just being sort of more ad advanced NK cells. Right? So even though they come from the same precursor, right, T cells have that extra T cell receptor on their surface that gives them the ability to recognize something new that you were not born with the ability to recognize. And that ability to recognize something new is a direct result of that T cell receptor being made through VDJ recombination. So let's uh, remind ourselves, last time we discussed that in order for a naive, um, inactive T cell to activate, it has to be presented uh, something like this red dot. And remember, all T cells recognize small, short peptides. That's what they're limited to recognizing, unlike the immunoglobulins of B cells that can recognize short peptides or large proteins or uh, any other type of, of biological molecule, like a carbohydrate or a fat, just as long as it's the same three-dimensional shape that the immunoglobulin and the B cell recognizes, hey, the B cell's happy, right? But T cells are different, remember. T cells, their T cell receptor can only recognize short peptides that are presented to it by some sort of cell that it is bumped up against or synapsing with. And as we've learned, right, that is, because T cells want to be able to tell what is happening with this other cell that it is pressed up against, right? And whether that other cell has evidence coming from inside of it that anything is kind of weird about it, right? Like maybe it has bits of protein from bacteria or bits of virus. So in the case of this cell here, this T cell, not only would its T cell receptor recognize the red dot, the small peptide that's being presented in this case on MHC class two, right? So right away you realize, oh, this T cell is what? Is a helper T cell, right? An inactive, naive helper T cell that then its T cell receptor happens to be the right shape to recognize the red dot being presented on MHC2 by this professional antigen presenting cell, we learned last time that importantly, in order for the T cell to feel confident that the signal that it's receiving is actually an important piece of evidence that there is some kind of threat going on here, like an infection, it needs to see the B7 co-stimulator protein, the dark green, pro dark green protein that is made by the antigen presenting cell Remember, only certain professional antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells during an infection will express this B7 salesperson badge. That's what we called it last time. And so that's received by the T cell CD28. And that combination of its T cell receptor binding something that it actually recognizes and well, and of course, the CD4 co-receptor here, verifying that it is MHC class two, right? Because that's what the CD4 T cell needs to see, that it in fact is binding to MHC class two. In addition to that, the second strong signal that's necessary is the T cell's CD28 receptor seeing or, or viewing the B7 co-stimulator protein, right? And that's how you know that it is a trustworthy salesperson who's presenting the peptide to you, 
Um, and then, you know, oh, okay, you know, this is something I should take seriously and I feel comfortable actually responding to this. Right? Because the alternative is what? If you have, let's say, uh, an antigen presenting cell, um, you know, it'd still be like a professional antigen presenting cell, maybe like a B cell, macrophage, dendritic cell, but maybe there's no infection going on at all at this time, right? But maybe there was just some leftover pieces from the infection, right? Because you can imagine it's not like the moment the infection is over, all of a sudden, all evidence of, of the infection suddenly disappears, right? It's a gradual process of your body clearing it out. So there's going to be bits and pieces of viral proteins, bits and pieces of bacterial proteins um, still in your system, right? What you don't want is to keep having your T cells getting activated again, right? Because what a waste of uh, effort and energy. So in that case, let's say an infection is long gone, but this particular antigen presenting cell still presents a little red dot, right? And this naive T cell wanders along in the lymph node and has a chance to see it, right? So it gets signal number one, right? Because its T cell receptor is the right shape to uh, bind to the uh, red dot here. But importantly, what? Because there's no infection going on anymore, right? The professional antigen presenting cell is no longer wearing the B7 salesperson badge. So this T cell fails to get that second sort of vote of confidence that it should actually respond. And as a result, this T cell becomes anergic, right? In other words, your immune system says, hey, that's great that your T cell receptor does recognize this thing, right? That's different. It's kind of unusual. We're not sure what it is, but you know what? Right now there's no evidence of any alarm or threat. So we would rather play it safe by not having you get all excited and start activating our adaptive immune response, right? So as a result, that T cell becomes anergic. Because in this case, instead of the trustworthy salesperson, right? I mean, it's kind of like, hey, here's, here's Homer, right? It's kind of sketchy in terms of who's presenting you the peptide, right? You can almost imagine Homer, mm, peptide, you know, you wanna share, right? Uh, and you're like, no, no, thanks, because I, I really don't know what's going on here, right? So importantly, if the T cell does get the proper peptide signal presented to it, and it sees the B7 signal that lets it know that the cell that's presenting it to it is trustworthy, and it should actually activate, we said last time that one of the most important cytokines involved in stimulating a T cell to activate is interleukin-2, right? So interleukin-2 will stimulate T cell proliferation and activation, right? Now, just because that T cell is activating, it doesn't necessarily know what to do next, right? In the case of a helper T cell, like what we're seeing here, remember, we said that the infection isn't happening necessarily in the lymph node where this T cell is being activated, right? The T cell just wandered into the lymph node, like a shopper at the mall browsing through there. Hey, it sees some things, it sees something that it likes and it activates, but it doesn't know what to do next. So that's when different cytokine messages that are coming into the lymph node from the site of infection will help inform or tell this activated helper T cell what type of infection is going on, and therefore what subtype of CD4 cell it should become. All right, so let's, let's look at this for a moment. Let's start by looking at how the interleukin-2 signaling stimulates the T cell to activate. <clears throat> on the surface of a naive inactive T cell, you would have receptor for IL-2 you know, in the process of being made. So the receptor for IL-2 has three main sort of peptide chain parts to it. Um, you know, uh, they, are, they are called the gamma, beta, and alpha chains of the IL-2 receptor. But I know that's horrible because all, the last thing we need is more Greek letters, right? That sound like we're talking about something else that we used gamma, beta, and alpha for. So for this class, you don't have to keep track of the fact that there's, there are these three parts called gamma, beta, alpha. But keep in mind, right? There are three parts that make up a complete IL-2 receptor that is the right shape on the surface of a naive T cell to bind the IL-2 cytokine. Before 
this T cell is activated, you can see on the left here, it only makes part of the receptor, right? The green and the yellow part. And as a result, even if there's IL-2 floating around and the IL-2 arrives at the surface of the cell, right? It's not really activating the cell, right? But if the cell is activated, right? Because it's T cell receptor binds something and then it's CD28 sees the B7 salesperson badge. That's that one, two combo. Uh, signal that then activates it, right? And it, and it wants to start proliferating. Right? That's when the cell starts making the third part of the receptor. So now it starts receiving a lot of IL-2 signal. So you can see here, right? Before it's activated, while the T cell is still naive, right? It's expressing this low affinity form of the IL-2 receptor. Right? Uh, and inside of its nucleus, hey, you know, just like any other cell in the body, it has the genes to be able to make things like that missing part of the receptor, the IL-2 receptor alpha part. And it also has the gene to make cytokine IL-2, right? So when the activated T cell is, uh, well, when the T cell is activated, what happens is these genes get turned on. So it starts making IL-2. So it itself starts making some of these orange little IL-2 triangles. And what does it do? It finishes making the IL-2 receptor. So as a result, if you follow this blue arrow over here, right, it's kind of like a feedback loop, right? It's making IL-2 and it is now responsive to IL-2. And so that feedback loop really stimulates the T cell to begin to proliferate. Right, so that's what you see down here. And then all of them are making more yellow, uh, orange triangles, and all of them are making lots of IL-2 receptor. So you can see, right, you suddenly get an abundance of this particular T cell. Okay. So importantly, once a T cell is activated that way, okay, it no longer needs to depend upon the professional antigen presenting cell showing it a B7 salesperson badge, right? Because it's already bought the red dot, right? It's already realized I want this red dot um, and I trust that the red dot is something I should be concerned about, right? Because I recognize the red dot and this professional APC told me I should be activated. Right? So if you look here, we have uh, activation of a naive, in this case, a CD8 T cell, right? So this is a T cell that in the lymph node meets up with a dendritic cell here, right? This is the professional APC that's presenting the red dot on MHC class one, right? And so as a result, this T cell then, um, that up until now has never bound anything, right? It sees the red dot. It sees that it's MHC1 because it has this CD8 co-receptor that confirms it's MHC class one. So that's signal number one. And then of course it also sees the B7 badge. So that is C signal number two, right? So it starts making IL-2 cytokine and IL-2 receptor, right? And what happens is you have this uh, autocrine or self feedback loop that causes the naive T cell to really activate and start making many, many copies of itself. And in addition, so this shows that this one cell made two, right? But it's gonna be doing this a lot. So you're gonna get a lot of identical T cells made. Importantly, this also causes the, the cytotoxic T cell to finish its differentiation. Meaning now it starts making all of those cytotoxic uh, cytokines inside of it and it has them in these vesicles. And now the activated CD8 cell goes off in your body and tries to find, right? Tries to find other examples of your body cells that are infected by whatever this thing is, let's say a virus, right? Where the red dot comes from. And so now that CD8 cell goes out to work and when it encounters viral infected cells, like maybe the lining of your respiratory tract, for example, right? It binds because the virus infected cells, right? Look at that. They are, oh, these, these cells are really sad, right? Because now they're hijacked and they're about to make lots of virus particles, but the little red dots are presented by these cells on MHC1 so that this cytotoxic, this activated CD8 cell comes by, sees it. Now at this point, because this T cell is activated, right, it no longer cares that this cell that it's bumped up to is not wearing a B7 salesperson badge, right? 
because that happened way over here on the left. Once it's activated and it's gone to work, just as long as its T cell receptor sees the red dot and its CD8 co-receptor confirms right, that it's being shown this on MHC1, this T cell will release those nasty cytotoxic messages that it has built up in its vesicles. And when this target cell receives those messages, that target cell undergoes apoptosis and dies. Right? And the scary thing is, after this T cell killed this one, it just moves to the next cell, right? And then the next one. And just as long as it, the cell that it bumps into is presenting the red dot, this cytotoxic T cell will kill it, right? Again, that's why our immune system is pretty conservative with activating T cells, right? Because, you know, last thing you really want is a whole bunch of cytotoxic T cells going around killing your uh, body cells when they really shouldn't be. But the point is, at this point, anytime it encounters a cell that's just showing the red dot, the cytotoxic T cell does its thing. Okay. But what about CD4 T cells then? So both the CD4 T cell and the CD8 cytotoxic T cell, remember they were both um, finished their T cell receptor um, production and their training in the thymus. Both of them were released into the blood where they made their way into lymph nodes, right? And in the lymph nodes and other secondary lymphoid tissues, that's where they're activating. We looked on the previous slide, we said the cytotoxic T cells are kind of more simple minded, right? Just as long as it sees a signal that a professional dendritic cell in the thymus shows, uh, not in the thymus, sorry, in the lymph node shows it along with the B7 badge, then that cytotoxic T cell gets all ramped up and excited. It goes off and starts killing. Right? But helper T cells, the CD4 helper T cells, they have to stick around a little bit in the lymph node to kind of figure out what they're supposed to do next, right? Because their job is not to go out and start hunting for, bo for body cells that are showing this red dot and killing them, right? No, that's the job of the cytotoxic T cells. Helper cells need to help other immune cells, help coordinate other immune cells, right? And the issue there is different types of immune responses are most effectively dealt with by certain types of cells doing certain things as part of a coordinated defense response. So that response would be different if it's a virus infection versus a bacterial infection versus infection by something like a parasitic worm, right? So as a result, that means these CD4 cells that are gonna to try to organize these responses, right? They also work by making different types of cytokines in little vesicles that are gonna get released onto target cells, right? But these are like helper cytokines, right? That are gonna encourage whatever other immune cell it's talking to, to wake up and start doing its job, right? But how does a CD4 cell know what these cytokine messages are, right? Whether they are meant for a B cell that it's gonna bump into or a macrophage or neutrophil, et cetera. So a CD4 cell that's uh, activated in the lymph node must know what kind of effector molecule, or what kind of effector cell it should be going around and activating next. And so it knows this, based upon what type of emergency right, your body is facing, what type of infection. So if you look at, if you think about, for example, right, um, large um, like federal emergency um, management teams, things like that, like FEMA, they are sent out to deal with all kinds of natural as well as man-made uh, disasters, right? Whether it's like a biohazard spill or a fire or a flood, Right, teams of these people hit the ground and they go out. And importantly, right, these people are trained for particular scenarios. So these people in the bio hazmat suits, you know, they know how to decontaminate, let's say a toxic waste spill. Right? The firefighters obviously know how to properly fight different types of fires. And these people here are trained to be able to do flood rescue. Right? When they hit the ground, these teams of specialized people have to be coordinated by supervisors who are on the ground with them. So these supervisors are like the CD4 helper cells, right? They know the game plan. 
they know who's supposed to do what and how to carry this out in order for a very specific type of threat that they're dealing with. Right? And I hope that makes sense to you. You have to recruit the right immune response in order to really effectively fight the particular type of emergency your tissues are facing. So that's why this takes us back to our discussion that there are five subclasses of effector T cells, right? That a activated CD4 helper T cell that up until now was naive and it was just kind of minding its own business, going through the blood, the lymph, blood, the lymph. Then it came into this lymph node where, oh boy, here's a professional antigen presenting cell like a dendritic cell, right? There was an infection going on. So the dendritic cells wearing its salesperson badge, the B7. And guess what, right? That, in, that dendritic cell is displaying the red dot that this um, naive CD4 helper cell recognizes, right? So then that CD4 helper cell activates, right? So it starts doing IL2 expression. So it begins to divide, but then it's like, uh, what are we dealing with? What am I supposed to do, right? So it understands what it's supposed to do, meaning which of the five subtypes of, of helper T cell it needs to become next based upon all these other cytokine messages that are sort of showing up inside the lymph node where it is activating. Inside the lymph node, that environment is a big soup of different cytokines. Right? And these cytokines are coming from the site of infection. Right? So remember we saw a cartoon of you stepped on a tack or something like that, right? And, uh, and maybe there's some sort of nasty bacteria that comes in through, through the wound, but maybe the lymph node where your lymphocytes are actually activating is quite a distance away from where that tack is actually poked into your foot, right? But the cells in the infected tissue are releasing different types of cytokine messages depending upon what type of infection you're dealing with, viral or bacterial or parasitic. And those different cytokine types are also draining into your lymph vessels along with the dendritic cells that are bringing bits and pieces of the pathogen right, into the lymph node. Right? And so the soup of cytokines in the lymph node where that particular CD4 helper cell is activating will now tell it what subtype of CD4 helper cell it needs to become. So that's why we go back to this table here. Last time when we saw this, I said, oh, just know that there are five types of CD4 helper cells. And on the bottom here, they do different functions, right? These are the other types of immune cells that they are going to be coordinating or talking to. Now let's look at the middle, right? So these are the cytokines in the soup of cytokines in the lymph node where this T cell is activating that will tell it to become a Th1 cell or a Th17, Th2, or a follicular helper T cell, you know, or a regulatory T cell, right? And they have different jobs. Right. So this is like those federal emergency management supervisors hitting the ground with their team to be able to properly deal with biohazard spill, a fire or a flood, right? Because these down here, macrophages, neutrophils, antibodies, uh, B cells represent the specialized immune cells that they're trying to coordinate and get them to do their function. Okay, so let's look at this this important uh, event of cytokine-induced specialization of CD4 T cells. So we said that the cytokine mix in the local lymph node where you know, evidence of pathogen infection is being drained into and where the lymphocytes are activating reflects the need uh, of your immune system to be able to mount the proper type of response. So let's say, for example, if the CD4 helper cell is um, mixed with IL-12 and interferon gamma, right, then uh, these signals are coming from things like dendritic cells and macrophages and, nat and natural killer cells right, from the site of infection. Uh, and then as a result, these Th1 helper CD4 cells will preferentially work on activating other macrophages. In other words, the cytokines that the Th1 cell starts making is the right language to speak specifically to macrophages, to increase the activity of macrophages and to increase inflammation at the site of infection, right? So that's really helpful if the infection is bacterial 
in origin. Right? Macrophages getting them to eat more bacteria and also getting local inflammation started at the site of infection, right? Those are things that help uh, increase your fight against bacteria. However, let's say the infection is this nasty multicellular worm, okay? Uh, now this worm is way too big for something like a macrophage to eat, right? I mean, if you were to imagine, I mean, this worm in this picture is probably made up of like a thousand cells, right? So an individual cell might be the size of a macrophage that's coming up to fight it, right? I mean, that's kind of like futile, right? What's a macrophage going to do? Um, at the same time, this parasite is in your tissue and it's kind of like eating its way through your tissue. So the last thing you want is to what? make your tissue inflamed and even easier for this parasite to eat its way through, right? So in that case, that would be like an opposite type of re appropriate responses than the bacteria infection would require. So in this case, IL-4 that's being released from the site of infection by like tissue that's being damaged by the parasite, right? That is what's gonna be in the lymph node when this CD4 helper cell is activated Right? And it sees like a little red dot a peptide or something that came from, you know, this parasite, right? Uh, and it sees, oh, I'm swimming in IL-4. It's a parasitic infection. So it will go and preferentially start making cytokines that talk to, in the right language, things like basophils, right? These other big granulocytes. Um, the response is it will actually suppress inflammation in the area right? Because maybe more inflammation is the last thing you need in the area. It will start encouraging the healing of tissue in the area. And it'll start telling B cells to class switch their immunoglobulins. Remember, a B cell started off with IgM, right? But B cells are capable of switching the antibody form to something like IgG or A or E. And in this case, IgE is the antibody type that's the most effective against fighting against something like a multicellular worm. We'll learn about that a little later. I think you'll like that when you actually see how these IgEs work to fight against something like a big thousand cell worm. Right? Um, and so the, CD, the Th2 CD4 helper T cell will stimulate things like basophils and eosinophils, right? Those very rare granulocytes. Remember among the different the five types of white blood cells that are in your blood, right? never let monkeys eat bananas, right? These are the two rarest ones, the eosinophils and the basophils. Because quite frankly, you know, you're probably not dealing with multicellular worm infection all the time, right? Hope not. Okay. So this decision then of an activated CD4 T cell deciding which type of CD4 helper subclass to become, hey, that's a really critical decision, right? Because you don't want to mess that up. It's like as though if there was a uh, flood that was happening, you know, in some town somewhere, right? And, and this, the civilians in the town need help and you sent in a bunch of firefighters, right? That's not good, right? So is there evidence of our immune system sometimes making a mistake? Yes. We call this type of phenomenon polarization of CD4 T cell responses. In other words, your immune system will decide, you know, what type of response it needs and the CD4 cells that are maturing, right, will become that particular subclass of CD4s that work best to coordinate a particular type of response. And that may or may not be the right thing under the situation. Here's an example. So leprosy, right, terrible disease, um, it's caused by a, a bacterium um, and that, ba that leprosy bacterium um, can actually infiltrate and infect the cells of your body. So this is a bacteria that actually gets inside of the cells, it's intracellular, right? So that poses its own types of problems because normally we've been talking about bacteria that's just kind of hanging out in your tissues between your cells, right? So as a result, that type of bacteria that's between your cells is an easy target for things like complement proteins, macrophages, neutrophils, even antibodies, right? But if you have a bacteria that's inside of your cell, that's kind of trickier, 
because things like macrophages, neutrophils, and antibodies can't get into the cell. So you can imagine that a situation like this can cause a bit of confusion for your immune system. So patients who present with leprosy typically present with two different types of clinical uh, profiles in terms of type of disease. We call it tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy. In the first case, in tuberculoid leprosy, this is when your immune system starts making what we call granulomas. In other words, the cells that are infected start getting surrounded by other cells, like immune cells, to try to contain the infection and prevent the bacteria from spreading away from there. If a patient uh, has an immune system that uh, decides to go in this direction, that usually involves high Th1 CD4 T cell activity, right? So as the CD4 cells are activating, the cytokine messages convince the immune system and these little T cells to become Th1 type immune cells. So this gets things like macrophages moving, right? And macrophages go and they start trying to like actually create these um, sort of granulomas uh, to keep the bacteria contained. As a result, there's very low infectivity of uh, this form of leprosy because the bacteria is kind of then packed away in tissues. I mean, there's gonna be damage to your tissues. There's gonna be some local inflammation, some nerve damage as well. Importantly, think about this, right? You think you would find a sudden boost in antibodies at all? Mm, no, probably not, because antibodies can't get inside of your body cells to fight. So in this case, right, your immune system says, yeah, there's no use making extra antibodies, right? So we're not gonna waste time with that. So people who present with tuberculoid leprosy have normal serum levels of immunoglobulins, right? uh, and they have normal T cell responsiveness that are specifically responsive to the uh, antigens that are coming from the um, mycobacteria leprae uh, bacteria. Uh, and so this encourages effector cells to participate in trying to contain the disease. The more serious form, the more debilitating form of leprosy, the one that we kind of historically think of as being the awful kind, where you have people who start losing uh, tissue in their body, like fingers, you know, limbs, things like that, is the lepromatous form of disease. It's the same pathogen, Right? The same M. leprae bacteria that gets into a person's cells, but in this case, the person's immune system responded by encouraging production of Th2 CD4 T cells. And Th2 CD4 T cells encourages an antibody response, right? So this is kind of a mistake, right? Um, so as a result, the antibodies can't even get to the bacteria because the bacteria are hiding out inside of cells. Um, so the bacteria is allowed to just spread, spread throughout the body, and you get a lot of damage to bone, cartilage, uh, a lot of nerve damage. It's highly infectious. Right? And importantly, these patients present with super elevated levels of immunoglobulins in their blood, as though their immune system is just keeps ramping up antibody protection as things, uh, antibody production as things get worse, but it's kind of futile right? Because antibodies are not going to be effective against the bacteria. Right? So just think, that's the difference here. It's the same pathogen, the same um, mycobacteria leprae pathogen that infected these two patients. It's just in one patient's body, it polarized the production of CD4 cells to Th1 type. In the other patient, it polarized the production of CD4 T cells to Th2 type. And that's made a tremendous difference on the prognosis uh, and the course of these two patients dealing with their disease. All right, so let's um, go back to this slide here. Because um, remember, this slide is a reminder that our lymphocytes, like our T cells, are constantly circulating between our blood and then into our lymph system, and then eventually off the screen somewhere, it eventually gets back into our blood again, and they come around right through the hundreds of different lymph nodes in your body. And then here's a lymph node that happens to be closest to the site of infection, right? So this is where the, these lymphocytes are activating in this lymph node here. So here's a question. You already know um, that these cells that are passing through the blood have to be able to tell right, where they are in their body, right? Are they just passing through the blood somewhere like, you know, um, in surrounding tissue, or are they actually passing through the blood, going through a lymph node? Depending upon 
if we are talking about T cells that are naive and have not activated yet versus T cells who are active and are going out and trying to do their job, it's quite different, right? In terms of where those T cells want to exit the blood. Right? Some of them want to exit into lymph nodes to check things out. Some of them are already activated. They're trying to do to go to work. They're trying to find sites of infection. So there are multiple different receptors and proteins on the surfaces of T cells that um, are in charge of allowing a T cell that's floating through your blood to know where it's at. So this is just like we talked about before with things like neutrophils, right? Having to have certain types of proteins on their surface so they can stick to certain regions of the inside of blood vessels. In the case of neutrophils, right? It was different types of things that would uh, be uh, expressed on the inside of blood vessels that are close to the site of infection. Hey, so that's kind of a similar story here. Uh, there's a number of different um, receptors shown here, uh, some of which you already know. For example, T cell receptor, CD4 is listed here. Um, and what they're trying to show is the difference between a naive T cell that hasn't activated yet, so it's resting, right, versus one that has been activated and is going to work. So if you look at CD4 and T cell receptor, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's resting or if it's at work, it's gonna have CD4 and T cell receptor on its surface, right? If this is a helper T cell. But some of these other receptors might change. Um, so rather, being, rather than being overwhelmed with memorizing all of these, I want you to focus on this first set over here on the left. Right? And in particular, the fact that whether, whether the T cell is resting and naive or activated, it has this LFA on its surface, but depending on if it's resting or activated, it'll express things like L-selectins uh, versus VLA4. So selectins attract naive T cells to exit the blood when they're passing through a lymph node, right? So that makes sense. Naive T cells want to exit the blood into lymph nodes, so they have a chance to potentially activate. On the other hand, a T cell that's already done that and actually activated and is going off to do its job, it doesn't want to necessarily go into lymph nodes again and again and again, because that's not where the action is, right? Now that it's activated, it wants to find the site of infection where the cells that are infected are. So those cells express VLA4 so that VLA4 can attract circulating effector T cells to stop at infected tissue sites. Um, so here's an example, right? So here is the LFA1, all T cells, all T cells, no matter if they're resting or not, um, produce LFA1. So LFA1 binds to certain ICAMs or uh, intracellular adhesion molecules that are presented by any target cell, right? Because when a T cell, in order for it to work, even in, in order for it to activate, it has to synapse with some other cell, right? Even if that other cell is just a dendritic cell that's going to actually potentially wake it up. Right? So the LFA ICAM interaction is one of the strongest interactions that allow T cells to interact with other cells at all. Right? But on top of that, an activated T cell will express VLA4 so that as it's going through the blood, if it bumps into activated endothelium, what do I mean by that? Remember, endothelium is the, the cells that line the inside of your blood vessels. And activated mean, oh, these are cells that happen to be closest to the spot where, you know, next door in the tissue, there's the infection going on. So activated means these endothelial cells are starting to express different signs, right, to get the T cells to stop and exit. Uh, so those signs are things like VCAM1, right? That way, this activated effector cell that has VLA4 will slow down and stop and stick to the inside of the blood vessel because there's VCAM1. And then this T cell will then undergo diapodesis, right? That's that process of our lymphocytes and other immune cells squeezing their way out of the capillary to get into the tissue. Uh, so be familiar with these four examples here, right? um, and, uh, and I'll be happy if you know these four, so at least you know the concepts. So T cells carry out their jobs with cytokines and cytotoxins. Right? So I should say all T cells communicate using cytokines, because remember cytokines just means small little proteins that it makes that serve as signals for other cells to interpret. Right? But 
cytotoxic T cells, they make a very special kind of cytokine, right? Because these cytokines are what we call cytotoxic cytokines or just cytotoxins. Because if a target cell receives these, these are the little messages that tell that target cell to undergo apoptosis and die, right? Because it's infected. Um, so cytokines, cytotoxins, I mean, they're all just small molecules made by activated T cells, but they have different properties and functions. All T cells will make numerous types of cytokines, and um, many of them are made only upon contact with target uh, to be able to actually make it worth its while to make certain types of messages. Why is that? Well, in particular, with the case of CD4 helper cells, Remember this CD4 helper T cell activated in the lymph node, depending upon the cytokine soup that it was swimming around in in the lymph node, it knew that it wanted to become, let's say, a subtype of um, CD4 cell like Th2 that talks specifically to things like B cells, right? Um, so then it goes off, but until it actually meets up with the B cell, it's not gonna make those particular cytokine messages that B cells understand, right? It has to wait until it actually binds to a B cell, and then it'll start releasing things like these green triangles, because that's the right language of cytokines that a B cell will understand. Okay. And that will then tell the B cell, you know, hey, I'm here to help you. I want you to do this next. I want you to go ahead and start activating, dividing. Maybe some of you start turning into plasma cells or some of you start switching the type of immunoglobulins you're making from IgM to let's say IgE. Cytotoxic T cells are a little different because they're primarily making these types of cytotoxic cytokines. And these, because they're kind of generic, right? A CD8 cell knows what it's gonna do. It's always gonna release these particular sets of nasty cytotoxins. These tend to be more pre-made and stored in lytic granules or vesicles inside the CD8 cell. So if it encounters a virus infected cell, right, it goes ahead and just knows to kill it, All right? So this table here, I know it looks like another complicated table, but it's really not. It's just another summary. So you have your five types of CD4 T cells here, right, with their names. Um, then it lists what type of cytokines they produce in order to communicate and carry out the functions on the bottom here. So this top part and this bottom part are very similar, practically identical to the table that we saw before. But that table before, the cytokines that were being listed represented the cytokines that are present in the lymph node to convince a, a um, naive T cell to become one of the different five types. What this table is saying is now that those five types of T cells have been formed and they're going off doing their job, these are the cytokine messages that they make in order to talk to their target cells, right? So these different interleukins and things are the specific language of cytokines that macrophages understand or eosinophils understand or neutrophils or B cells understand, right? Um, you don't have to memorize these, but it's very important that you understand that concept that it's only because these CD4 T cells became these different subtypes do they then know how to speak the language of cells that they're going to communicate with. And then the CD8 cells just make these cytotoxins. Okay, so when you have a helper T cell that encounters another cell target and it wants to help it, so in this case, there's a macrophage that's busy eating bacteria and presenting things on MHC2, Right, this Th1 cell recognizes that and it knows to speak the language of macrophages because it's a Th1 cell. You might say, how does this macrophage know to listen? It knows to listen because the CD4 helper cell makes another protein called CD40 ligand on its surface. And this CD40 ligand is received by this receptor, CD40, on the surface of the macrophage. This is really important. Right? Because this limits the communication to between this pair of cells. So in other words, as interferon gamma starts being made by this helper T cell, because that's one of the language of macrophages that this Th1 cell knows how to speak, think about it. These, what are these, peach-colored triangles right, that are floating out of this, of this T cell, it's like a cloud of these. 
right? There are going to be other macrophages nearby and other cells. You don't want those other cells receiving this message also, right? Because you don't know what those other cells are. They might be something that you don't want to activate because that has nothing to do with fighting this particular infection. So the macrophage has CD40 on it, and this T cell presents CD40 ligand, which basically says, hey, you, you specific macrophage here that I'm talking to, I'm going to send out a cytokine message now, and this is meant for you, right? And so as a result, this macrophage makes the interferon gamma receptor and is able to pick up on the message, and then this helps the macrophage start increasing its activity. Okay, last slide for the day. This is pretty quick. Uh, this is just a neat slide because it shows you how T cells are able to direct their uh, message to the particular cell that they want, especially something like in the previous slide, we saw a CD4 cell limiting its communication to that macrophage. Right? Here is a cytotoxic T cell that's going to send cytotoxic messages out. And again, it's going to be sent out in a cloud. Right? So how is it that other cells that are nearby are spared this message? Because if you have a cloud of cytotoxic messages, you might have normal little cells that are hanging around nearby and they start getting these messages and they start killing themselves. That's bad, right? So one of the ways that a cytotoxic T cell is able to direct its cytotoxic messages is by carefully releasing the cytotoxic messages, not as just a generic cloud around it, but in the particular direction of the target cell that it's synapsing with. So here you can see this cytotoxic T cell, right? It is synapsing with this target cell. And at first it's synapsing just because of those more um, general types of uh, receptor interactions like the, the LFAs and, and CAMs. This creates a strong interaction surface. And in that surface, you have the opportunity for the T cell receptor then to check out things like the dot, the little dot that's being presented here. If the T cell then activates the T cell receptor, what will happen is that the inside machinery of the cell that produces proteins, things like the Golgi complex, mitotic spindle, a mitotic network of microtubules, they will actually realign themselves to point in the direction where the T cell receptor signals are coming into the cell. And as a result, as uh, more and more cytotoxic proteins are made, they are actually physically directed in the direction of just that synapse surface between the two cells so that this um, infected cell right, gets the message to kill itself. Right? And here you can see, here's a T cell synapsing with a target cell and it has sent those cytotoxic messages over to, the, to this target cell and this target cell right? It's listening. It's gone ahead and killed itself. Okay. Let's go ahead and stop there.